Feel the Change, Exploring Climate Change Through Storytelling. Written, illustrated, designed and narrated by Ushin McGann. Supported by Poetry Ireland, Green Schools and Weather Stations. Part 2. Place. How does your character's environment affect their lives? This is the location or setting for your story. Your character must find themselves somewhere for that story to take place, and that place is an important element in the personality and the physical body of your character. Think about your own setting, the environment you're in right now. It's not like a backdrop in a play. You interact with it. The quality and pressure of the air in your lungs, the temperature of your environment, the food you eat, the level of sunlight shining on your skin, the lifestyle you have, the culture you live in, all affect who you are mentally, emotionally and physically. If you go to a completely different place that has a different effect, the fact that it's different affects how you feel and think, how you behave, and how people feel and think about you and behave towards you. And you in turn influence the environment around you when you interact with it. Most of what you see around you was probably put there by humans. We are constantly changing our environment. The same goes for your characters and their settings. They are always having an influence on each other. About the cartoon. When we write stories, we have to try and imagine ourselves in the position of the character. This often means that we have to take a point of view of someone who isn't like us and imagine ourselves in a situation we've never been in. Our characters have to get things wrong, make mistakes, do things that are stupid and even mean or cruel, because this is what happens in real life, and it's what drives stories. We all mess up from time to time. We also do damage to our environment, the things around us, either by accident or deliberately. While this can be incredibly annoying and frustrating in real life, it can also be very entertaining in fiction. Have a chat. Pick something from the environment in your life that you really rely on and imagine it was taken away. Try and pick something that's not too obvious, like air or food or water, but still something that's important to you. Can you think of things that humans damage on a regular basis? Are there some examples where that damage is necessary? Do you think we're good at judging how much damage we do and when to stop? Think of a situation where that damage isn't necessary, but we do it anyway. Can it be stopped? And if so, how? Can you think of a time when someone damaged something of yours and how it made you feel? Was it a big problem for you? Or was it just small but annoying? Is it something you could use in a story? A good technique for describing a character's feelings is to recall something in your life that affected your emotions in the same way and try to apply that to the situation in the story. Sometimes someone will shape their environment in a way that isn't bad for them, but it causes a problem for someone else. A new office building might block the view from your house. A dam could cut off water from someone further down the river. A neighbour might play their music too loud at night. The traffic on a road becomes too dangerous for children to be able to walk to their school. Think of your own examples. What would you change in your everyday environment right now if you had the power to do it? Pick things that humans have made and work together to figure out how they are connected to the natural world. The new view through an old window. When Liz spotted the figure up in the ruins of the abbey, she knew immediately that there was something odd about this new visitor. People walked up this way sometimes, but it wasn't a real tourist spot and she often thought of it as her place because it was on her family's land in the field out beyond the end of their garden. The site was little more than some stone foundations and low walls, though there was still one corner, part of the original chapel, that still stood several metres tall. Liz and her brother and sister had played out there for most of their lives. She was looking out through the kitchen window when she saw the figure, and for a minute she thought it might be her boyfriend, Dylan, sneaking around the back to try and give her a fright. Then she got a better look and saw it was a girl, someone she didn't know. Liz decided to go out and see who she was. She didn't really think there was anything suspicious about it until the other girl spotted her approaching and darted out of sight. Liz frowned. Her mum and dad didn't mind people coming out to look at the ruins as long as they didn't bother the cattle that grazed in the field. They were proud to have this piece of history on their land, but it was a few kilometres from town and he never saw kids out here on their own and this girl looked like a teenager. Liz often went out there for some peace and quiet and she had a little sheltered spot with a flat stone where she liked to sit and read her horror stories. Climbing the back fence, she strode across the field towards the ruins, carefully stepping over the crusty cow pats. A head peeked out from behind a wall and then quickly pulled back in again. There was something unsettling about this stranger. 
The girl had the same pale but flushed skin as Liz and the same long, dark blonde hair which had been blowing across her face. I can see you there, Liz called out. You don't have to hide. We don't mind people looking at the Abbey. Please leave me alone, the other girl shouted back. I'll go soon. Please, please stay back. Okay, thought Liz. Now I want to know what's going on. She kept walking, and the other girl scampered from the wall where she was hiding, further back into the remains of the building. Liz broke into a sprint across the open ground, going around the site, intent on catching the stranger on the other side. She came round the back just in time to see the other girl do an abrupt about turn and head off the other way. Liz was faster and jumped a low wall to follow her. The visitor was racing through the ruins like she knew her way, never missing her footing as she climbed up a wall and through a window. But Liz caught up with her and grabbed her jacket, stopping her short. Hey, you don't have to run. What's going on? Get back. Don't look at me. The girl covered her face. God, please, will you just let go and keep back? Two meters at least. Get back. Her panic tone unnerved Liz and she instinctively released the girl and took two steps back. The girl lowered her head so her hair hung over her face, pulled a piece of cloth from the pocket of her jeans and looped some strings over her ears. It was a light blue medical mask, the type you saw people wearing in hospitals. She held up her hands and took a breath. I'm sorry, but you can't come near me. Why not? Liz asked. Who are you? Why are you running from me? We don't mind people looking around here. I know. I, I was just looking to be on my own for a while. I, I need to hang around for a bit. Is that all right? Just this area around here. I need you to back out of it and wait outside the walls. What are you talking about? You can't order me around in here. Who are you? You can call me Beth, okay? I, I'm not trying to order you around. I just, I just need you to keep clear of this space in here. You can't be in here, in the floor space of the chapel. Maybe a bit further out too, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on here, Liz said. The girl sounded a little hysterical and Liz held her hands out to try and keep her calm. Hey, is it Beth, as in Elizabeth? That's my name too. I mean, my family call me Liz, most people do, but my friends in school actually call me Beth. The other girl, Beth, gave a little hello wave. Why are you wearing that mask? Liz asked her. Why am I... Beth hesitated. Uh, look, this is going to sound like a mad question, but what's the date? Liz regarded the other girl for a moment, arching an eyebrow. Bit out of touch, are we? Just, what's the date? It's the 7th of May. What year? Oh, come on. What are you, a time traveller? What year? Beth repeated insistently. 2016. It's the 7th of May, 2016. Ah, oh, nuts, Beth groaned. Look, I'm not moving from this spot until you tell me what's going on. That could be a really bad idea, Liz, for you as well as me. Like, seriously. Liz planted her feet a bit wider and folded her arms. Beth watched her do it and gave a smirk that was visible even with the mask on. Then the strange girl pointed out through the only remaining window frame in the wall of the chapel. Tell me what you see. Liz looked and then looked again. Framed by the stone rectangle were three huge wind turbines up at the top of the next hill. She knew this landscape in intimate detail. There were no wind turbines anywhere in the area. What? What's going on? In a fit of confused frustration, she went to grab Beth again, and Beth screeched and fought her off. Stay back from me, God, will you just listen? They squared off against each other, fists raised in a karate stance. Exactly the same karate stance. Liz looked curiously at her opponent. She'd obviously had the same kind of training. Beth looked off at the towering structures in the distance for a few moments, shook her head, and then let out a quiet sigh and lowered her guard. Ah, to hell with it. Okay, Liz, try not to freak out. And then she took off her mask. Liz's jaw dropped open and she felt suddenly dizzy. It wasn't that she felt like she was looking into a mirror because Beth's face was not a mirror image. It was Liz's own face, the right way round. Only it wasn't. It was a bit pudgier, the skin was blotchier and there were bags under Beth's eyes from lack of sleep. Her hair wasn't as well cut as Liz's either, but Liz had no doubt about it. She was looking at herself, a different version somehow, but it was her. Beth gave a slightly bitter smile. You were asking for it. Liz was an intelligent girl, though she was not particularly imaginative and tended to take life as it was. So if a girl who appeared to be her was standing right in front of her, then that was just how it was. Still, she needed to be sure. What's your favourite book? She asked. I've never told anyone. When I was you, it was Stephen King's Firestarter, Beth replied. But I've got other favourites now. I'm from your future, she pointed out the window. And so are the windmills. They'll be built up there a year from now. So that was that. Liz was talking to her future self. Okay then, fine. Beth put the mask back on. How is this happening? Liz asked. Last night, I mean, last night in my time, Beth corrected herself, an asteroid bounced off the Earth's atmosphere. 
They said on the news that whatever material it was made from had caused disturbances in the space-time continuum and that time spots were happening all over the globe. Little areas where different time periods were overlapping. I suppose this must be one of those. I just came out here to sit and read and now we're both here, so we must be in 2016 and 2020 at the same time. That's why you need to get out of this space. I don't know how long these things last. It might snap me back to my time any minute. Or, you know, not at all. You're from 2020, and you can time travel now. Not on purpose. It's an accident. A disaster, really. Nobody knows what's going on. How are you not totally freaking out about this? Liz held out her hands to grab Beth's shoulders, but Beth shoved her back. Stop. I told you, you have to keep back. Look, you can't touch me, all right? You have to keep your distance. For a start, I'm not freaking out because I'm all out of freaks. The last few years have been one freak out after another, and now we're in 2020, and I have no freaks left to give. Why? What's going on? Liz asked anxiously. I'm not sure I should tell you anything. I don't know what effect it'll have. You can't say that now, not after what you just told me. And I'm not budging from this spot until you tell me what's happening. All right, but just remember, some of this will sound bad, but things are, they're working out okay for you, Beth said. You're you're not to panic. Yeah, sure. Don't panic. That's exactly the thing people say when everything's okay. Beth sighed again and sat down on Liz's on their favourite stone, and Liz sat down a few metres away. Right, anyway, to start with, there's a pandemic, Beth began. That's why I'm wearing the mask. If I have the disease, I don't want to give it to you, and this helps stop me breathing it all over you. There's a virus called COVID-19 that appears near the end of 2019, and it spreads everywhere, all over the world. Oh my God, Liz gasped. Yeah, totally. Anyway, half of Ireland had to close down for ages to help stop the virus from spreading. We were off school, like, totally off school for six months. No school for six months? That's incredible. That's so cool. Yeah, no, it got to be a real drag, actually, Beth said. You're going to be in fifth year in 2020, remember? Your leaving cert is coming up next year. Try doing all that schoolwork at home on your own. No school friends around you. No crack. We were all chatting on video, but it's not the same. We have to keep our distance from people. You can't hug your friends. Ah, no, I love hugs. I know. You mean not even Dylan? Not even Dylan. And I've hardly seen Granny or Grandad except on a screen because they're the other side of the country. We didn't go on holidays this year because we can't travel. Airports are empty because hardly any planes are flying. Is this real? Liz exclaimed. She couldn't believe it. It all sounded so, so dystopian. I'm only getting started, Beth told her. Loads of shops and restaurants and all the pubs have had to close for months. You can only shop for essential stuff. There are lots of zombie apocalypse jokes because of the warning signs and the doom and gloom in the empty streets. Only a certain number of people can go into a shop and you have to wear one of these masks. When we're in school, we have to wear masks. We have to use sanitizer on our hands all the time. I'm washing or sanitizing my hands like six or seven times a day. It sounds mad. This this is normal. No, it is normal now. This is how it is every day now. They're not taking any chances. Lots of other things have been cancelled too. There's no karate training. We can still do running because it's outside, but there's no big races anymore, so it's hard to stay motivated. No charity runs either. That explains it, Liz said. Explains what? Well, you've kind of sort of let yourself go a bit. You look a bit rough. Hey, you git, that's not fair. You don't know how it is, Beth protested. I'm not doing enough training. No, I wasn't saying I'm stressed out to bits. I'm comfort eating to cope because my nerves are shot. You don't know what it's like. I'm actually doing really well, considering. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, and then they cancelled the leaving cert this year, Beth added. Everyone was working their butts off at home for these exams, and they just basically estimated what grades everyone was likely to get, and that's how the government decided what college places they got. Only hardly anyone can go into college now. It's all video lectures at home. Even some television and radio shows are being done from the presenters' homes. I don't even know if I'll be doing the exams next year or not. This can't be true, Liz insisted. There's just no way. This is what's normal now, Beth said again. This is what I'm telling you. There's so much that's going to change. I mean, there's Brexit as well. In June of 2016, uh, this year, Britain votes to leave the European Union. What does that mean? It's, uh, uh, don't worry. It's pretty boring and the news will be talking about it for years. They'll explain everything. But it's a big deal for Ireland too. And then there's Donald Trump being president. Trump? The reality show guy is going to be the American president. Yeah, he gets voted in in 2016. That all gets a bit mad. And then he got voted out again this year after he did everyone's head in. 
and the weather's going bananas. Climate change is totally a thing now. There's the beast from the east in 2018 when there's freezing weather and heavy snow in Ireland for weeks and everyone goes mad stocking up on bread and all the shops run out. They run out of bread. And there's floods in loads of places and wildfires all over the world, Beth went on. There's really bad bushfires in Australia in 2019. They kill loads and loads of koalas. Oh no, Liz put her hands to her mouth. I love koalas. I know, Beth said. And anyway, then COVID-19 appears at the end of 2019 and the whole world changes in 2020. I mean, the whole world. The life you have now, everything you think is normal, that's going to change. You won't think it can, but it does. None of this sounds real. That's what everybody keeps saying, Beth said in an exhausted voice. It's like a really long, slow disaster film and we're actually living in it. Now look, can you just move back out of the chapel? You don't want to get stuck in my time if I get snapped back, do you? But I am going to get stuck in your time, am I? Liz sobbed, throwing her arms up helplessly. That's where I'm headed. You're me in 2020. Yeah, but I mean, you don't want to get pulled in there now, Beth gave her a sympathetic look. It'll all change eventually. I didn't really understand it before, but everything changes and it keeps on changing. I didn't want to lay all this on you, but you wouldn't let go. Now, please move back out of here. I think I think if you keep the window in view and go back until you can't see the wind turbines on the hill anymore, that's the best way to be sure. She could see that Liz was upset and who could blame her after hearing all that? Listen, I know it sounds really bad, but there's good stuff happening too, she said softly. You'll see. Everyone's being a bit nicer lately, a bit kinder to each other. You're talking to the people around you more. You appreciate so many things and so many people that you took for granted. You know what's important. You see things differently. The scientists came up with vaccines for the virus in less than a year, which is pretty incredible, apparently. And Ireland's coming better than a lot of other countries. You know how frustrated you're getting right now, how you keep swearing at the news? Well, you finally feel like you can make a difference. You'll get involved in an environmental group in a couple of years and you'll go on marches and meet a bunch of new friends, some really cool people. You'll be connecting with people all over the world. Seriously, we're making things happen. We had an assembly in the doll and everything. We're making politicians sit up and pay attention. They don't know what to do with this. The world's a bit of a mess, but it feels like it's pushing towards something better. Oh, and you learn to bake. You can bake, Liz exclaimed. Oh yeah, trust me, baking's a whole thing in 2020. You're going to be a total baking queen. That's it, see? Things keep changing, but you change with them. It's like these ruins, Beth gestured around her at the chapel. A long time ago, this was a proper building. People worshipped their god here, and there was a completely different view out of that window, and that was what was not... She frowned, holding her hands out to the side suddenly. Hey, did you feel something strange there? What? Liz replied. Yeah, like like a wobble. She was backing away, not wanting to go, yet still wary that she might get pulled into this future chaos too early. Hey, what about Dylan? Are we still going out? We're still together, right? Dylan! Oh, oh my God! Beth gasped. I completely forgot. This will blow your mind. Wait till I tell you about Dylan. And just like that, she was gone, as if she'd never been there. Oh, nuts, Liz whimpered, taking a shuddery breath. That's just typical. It was deeply unsettling to see someone disappear right in front of you. She peered through the stone window frame. The wind turbines were gone too. She found she was shaking and wanted to sit down, but she didn't want to go and sit on the stones of the abbey. Instead, she turned back for the house and started walking. As she walked, she struggled to remember what Beth had told her, and jumping over the back fence into her garden, she found she only had a vague memory of what had just happened. It was like a fading dream, like trying to grasp smoke, and she frowned, turning to look back at the ruins of the abbey. What had she been thinking about? Something about the future and what things might be like in a few years as she was finishing school and planning for college. It seemed important at the time and now she couldn't for the life of her remember what it was. Things were going to change. That was the thought that had stuck with her. Normal was temporary. She was struck by the certainty that someday her life would be totally different and that would be okay. Now, however, she had a sudden urge to try and bake some bread. About the story. This story came from the idea of how we tend to view normality as something that can't change, when in fact it changes all the time. The pandemic that started in 2019 is a perfect example of this. Things we took for granted, like standing in a crowd, walking into a shop without using a mask or sanitizer, or going to school, changed in a very short period of time. Over the space of a few months, it became normal for children to do their schooling on screens at home. 
to see people walking around wearing masks and to see guarded checkpoints where they stopped people to ask where they were travelling to. Imagine explaining these major changes to the you of 2016. That idea was the starting point of the story. Almost every story is about a change in someone's life, usually one that creates a challenge for the character. It can be that they go to a different place or meet different people, or it could simply be that something about their environment changes. This is a major factor in the way we have to think about the climate crisis because our weather is changing, which will in turn change our environment, which will change our lives. Have a chat. Think of ways that your environment has helped shape who you are. It could be to do with how you dress or wear your hair. It could be scars or where parts of your skin are darker or more freckled than others because they see more sun. It could be the language you speak or the accent you speak it in. The world you live in has an effect on you. Think of some examples. These are things that also make you different to other people. It's a part of what makes you the person you are. Different places around the world have different climates, so they suffer different extremes of weather. What kinds of extreme weather have you heard about on the news and where were they? How are they different to what we get here? What kinds of problems do people face in other places that we don't have here and why? The setting affects the story. About the cartoon. There is a limit to the amount of land we have, the amount of soil we have to grow crops and wild areas to support wildlife. The more we take away from these purposes, the less life our land can support. We will also lose land to rising seas and to environmental damage. With this cartoon, I wanted to create an image that conveyed how self-destructive our activities can be. Have a chat. Everything we eat, everything we make, and everything we burn for energy comes from the ground. Our existence depends on them, so we have to think about the future of them. Our soil, along with the peat, coal, gas, and oil we burn for energy, formed from millions of years of dead organisms, mostly plant life, layer upon layer. Life like fungi, bacteria, and worms keep our soil fertile. Without them, we would not be able to grow food. What kinds of things can affect soil to prevent crops from growing in it? How do different kinds of weather have an impact? How many ways can you think of that we dig into the earth? Do we return the ground to its original state afterwards? Think of how much of earth's history is hidden deep beneath the ground, in the seabed, in glaciers and in the wood of old trees. Imagine discovering something unusual buried deep under the ground, something that might start a story. Cremation. I'm not sure when I first noticed that the tree was dead. I wasn't even sure what kind of tree it was, a poplar or maybe a birch. Before this, my main concern about it had been that it was close to the garage, which stands separate from the house in the corner of the garden. There were traces of cracks in the concrete around the base of the wall where it looked like the roots might eventually undermine the foundations. Like so many things in life, I didn't pay much attention to that tree until it became a problem. It was in a blind spot in my consciousness, there but unnoticed. There was this thing towering over the back of the garden, at least as high as the house, and I hadn't even looked at the leaves to see what type of tree it was. I was certainly paying attention to it now. It hadn't reached maturity, the trunk was less than a foot in diameter of the base, and it was about 30 feet tall. A thin, lanky adolescent yet to find its bulky strength, but already high enough to make an unwieldy corpse. I had noticed that the bark had started cracking and lifting away from the wood, no doubt due to a disease of some kind. With two young kids, a budding teenager, and all the work I still had to do on the house, we had a lot of other things going on. Having a disease in a tree treated was way down on my list of priorities. But soon the bark was peeling away in heavy leathery strips, exposing the pale bare wood of the trunk. Wood lice took up residence in busy clumps in the gaps and cracks of the sloughing skin. When the leaves didn't come back in the spring, I knew we had a problem. A dead tree, big enough and close enough to damage the roof and even the wall of our garage if it fell. This wasn't the first tree to threaten our home. On the day we picked up the keys for our new house, we arrived to find a heavy bough had fallen from an ancient horse chestnut at the back of the garden in the other corner. One of a line of gnarled and ancient trees that ran behind the row of houses and had been there long before anything had been built on the land. The branch had narrowly missed our neighbour's garage and could have done thousands of euros worth of damage. There we were with a house in need of renovation, an empty shell still waiting for a heating system, a kitchen, bathrooms and even doors. 
So much of our money was bound into this place for the next few years. And now the first thing we had to do was pay 600 euros to chop down a dead chestnut tree. Apart from the fact that I hated having to cut down such a beautiful old beast, it was money we simply couldn't spare. But there was no avoiding it. If the tree fell, it could demolish our neighbour's garage or crash through the back of our house. That job took a full day, with three men, a cherry picker and a tractor and trailer. The house was showered in sawdust that floated into the air in gritty clouds as the tree surgeons started high and worked their way down in a roar of chainsaws, lopping off a piece at a time and either dropping them or lowering them on ropes. That old chestnut ended up spread out across our garden in its component parts as if waiting to be assembled again. I watched as much as I could, trying to learn how they did it. I figured I never knew when I might need to cut down a tree myself. They wouldn't take the logs in part payment and I couldn't keep them in the garden. They'd take up too much space and wreck our back lawn. Something else we wouldn't have money to fix for a few years. I didn't have the chainsaw or the skills to chop the huge logs into pieces I could burn, so I kept a few chunks let a friend of mine take as much as his car could hold and let the tree surgeons drive off with a large tractor trailer full of logs from our tree. That was in 2010, just before we had the worst winter Ireland had seen in decades, when I ended up burning logs almost every day for about four months. Logs I had to buy. I was well bruised from kicking myself over that winter. And then the other tree died. I could appreciate the irony. One of the things I'd looked forward to about finally owning my own property was planting a few trees with the kids. Instead, there would be two less trees in the world because of me. We were hit with several weeks of windy weather and I anchored the brittle mast of dead wood as best I could with a couple of ropes, worried that it would fall before I had a chance to control that fall. In the meantime, I started doing a bit of research online, learning how to cut down a tree. There were a number of helpful demo videos on YouTube and many, many more that showed the accidents that could happen when idiots with no expertise or experience tried some DIY lumberjacking. Smashed roofs, walls, cars, cut and crush injuries. There seemed to be no end of the damage you could do with relatively little effort. I also found out it was impossible to hire a chainsaw in Ireland, presumably because of the aforementioned idiots and the amputated limbs that resulted. But I was still confident. This wasn't a huge tree, and as long as I could get it to fall diagonally across the garden, it wouldn't do any damage. I wouldn't even need a chainsaw. I had a couple of bow saws I figured would do the job. I love wood in all its forms. I love walking in forests. I love working with wood with my hands. I love the colours and textures, the feel of cutting and shaping it. I like to burn it too. I prefer a wood fire to a peat fire. There may be less heat and it does burn out faster depending on how well the wood is seasoned, but it also burns out almost completely leaving hardly any ash compared with the mounds left over when you burn peat. I hate the powdery grey clouds that ash makes when you have to clear out the fireplace. It's better for the environment too. The managed forests replace trees as they're felled. Young trees absorb carbon as they grow and hold onto it, so using wood as fuel is, theoretically, carbon neutral. As long as we're replacing them, they're not adding any new carbon to the atmosphere. Theoretically. Frankly, it would be better if we didn't burn anything at all. Ireland's peat bogs, on the other hand, will take hundreds, if not thousands of years to form again, if it's even possible. And in the meantime, we're releasing all the carbon trapped for thousands of years in that peat. The oil, coal and gas we've based most of our civilization upon have taken even longer to form, and there's no question that they'll eventually run out. A wood fire sounds better than peat too. It's the sound of a comfortable home. Every couple of months, we get sacks of logs delivered. They're always too big for the fireplace, too chunky to get a fire going. And for someone who works at a desk a lot of the time... There's no better stress relief than getting the axe out and spending an energetic hour splitting logs and chopping some kindling. The weather was getting cold again. There were new storms coming and the tree had been standing dead for too long. So one Saturday I went out and I tied two new ropes to branches halfway up to help steer it as it fell. The other end of one rope was anchored to a heavy stake in the ground and the second tied to the trunk of another tree. Our teenage son was too cool to be interested but our two daughters, three and four and a half years old, were fascinated. They were under strict instructions to wait inside out of the way, but they pressed their faces against the back window waiting for Daddy to amuse them, which of course was my most important role in life. The key thing was making sure the tree fell across the lawn, not towards the house, not onto the hedge and fence that bordered the back of the garden, and definitely not onto the garage. And obviously, I had to be careful not to be flattened by it too. A lot of the YouTube videos went through my mind as I started sawing. Climbing a stepladder, I cut off a couple of the bigger branches on the garage side, hoping the loss of weight on that side would help persuade it to fall the other way. Then I started on the trunk. I cut two wedges, one on the front and one slightly higher up on the back, leaving it standing on a hinge of wood, 
just a couple of inches thick, which should, in theory, dictate the direction of the fall. The wood was taut, but lifeless and dry. I had assumed the tree was unstable, unbalanced and brittle, just waiting to topple at the first bite of the saw. Instead, it just stayed standing there after I cut out the second wedge, attached to its stump by no more than two inches of wood across the trunk. I gazed up into its branches, wary of its weight, but surprised and struck by a newfound respect for how well formed this thing was. Thirty feet high, with asymmetrical branches and yet so precisely balanced that it stayed upright on a base little thicker than the edge of my hand. It had taken more than ten years to get to this size, through all manner of weather, and even now the life was gone from it, it was still stronger than I'd given it credit for. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see my two little girls at the window, waiting. Putting a hand against the trunk, I pushed, and the tree came toppling down, hitting the marshy lawn with a soft, crunching thump. I couldn't hear my daughters from outside, but my wife later told me she'd never heard the girls laugh so loud. Their daddy pushed a tree down with one hand. I untied the ropes, then set about cutting the tree up into logs and sticks. I left them along the wall of the garage to season for a while, stacking the inner branches into a rack I'd made by the fence and tossing the bundles of twigs into a pile to be used as kindling. We only light a fire in the evenings, so it might burn for three or four hours before we let it go out. That tree took over ten years to grow and we used up all the wood from it in less than three weeks. I thought a lot about that, the whole idea of burning stuff for heat and energy. And that's what we do, despite having other limitless sources of energy at our disposal. We continue to burn in hours, something that takes years, centuries or millennia to form. As a species, we are setting fire to our house to keep warm. We are, ever so slowly, cremating the earth we live on. I love a good fire, but I miss the tree. About the story. This was the story of how I had to cut down a tree in my garden. Having to cut it down made me think a lot about its form, how it had grown, and how I was going to deal with it when this column of dead wood became a threat to our garage. Trees are largely formed from air. Nearly half of the structure of the wood is created out of carbon, which is drawn from the air as carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. The same carbon dioxide we breathe out. When that wood is burned, all that carbon is released back into the atmosphere, turned back into carbon dioxide. Peat, coal, gas and oil are all older forms of the same thing, living things that died and whose remains were crushed down into the earth over thousands or millions of years. This is why we call them fossil fuels. Millions of years worth of carbon that should not have been released. Now there's too much of that carbon dioxide in the air because of all the fossil fuels we've been burning, and along with other greenhouse gases, that carbon dioxide is acting like a blanket, holding in too much of the sun's heat. The tree had taken years to grow and we burned all of it in the space of a few weeks and that was only with the occasional fire. That made a big impression on me. Have a chat. Think of your basic needs, the things you have to have to stay alive and healthy every day. What do you rely on? Pick one thing that you need and describe what would happen if you started running short of it. A shortage of resources can be a small personal problem or a massive global issue. Wars have started over things like water supplies, farmland, or resources like coal, gas, or oil. Our environment supplies our needs, and sometimes there's conflict over who has control over a limited resource. Pick two things that people fight over today, one that's small and personal, one that countries would go to war over. These kinds of things are sources of drama for stories. Now pick two examples of a shared resource where people have agreed on a system to avoid fighting over it. One small and personal, one on a national scale. These are ways of avoiding conflict we don't want in real life. Look at the place around you, assuming it's somewhere you know well, and imagine something has changed, something you didn't expect. It could be something fairly ordinary, like the walls have been painted, or it could be something weird, like gravity has failed and everything is floating around in the air. Forget characters, just concentrate on the setting. Make a change that would make you stop and wonder, what on earth is going on? Remember, stories are often about change. The more you look, the more you'll notice that your environment is always changing. About the cartoon. The world is not going to end. Climate change means just that, change. However, some of those changes will be on a very big scale. It will affect farmland, cities, coastlines, wilderness, the oceans, glaciers and sea ice, as well as all the people and animal life that live in all those habitats. We can stop some of this from happening by tackling the causes of climate change. Some of those changes are locked in though, and they are going to happen no matter what we do. 
Fortunately, humans are extremely good at adapting to our environment or adapting our environment to us. Have a chat. Look around you. Give some examples of ways that we humans have adapted to our environment. No matter where you are, unless you're naked in the wilderness somewhere, there will be examples all around you. And I don't just mean protecting yourself from the weather. What does each thing enable you to do? Is there anything you think is particularly clever? Is there anything near you that doesn't work properly? Why? Is there anything near you whose purpose you don't understand? Is there anything you've never noticed before?